you say, well, there's so many different English versions because they're trying to get the translation right. If we could just go back to the original Greek, we could solve the problem, right? Okay, let's do that. Let's go back to the original Greek. This one or that one? The Nestle Allen Metzger, the UBS, Sinaiticus. Which one do you want to go back to? So there's three basic lines of manuscripts. The manuscripts where Paul actually did his ministry was this area right here. Antioch, the first city to commission missionaries and the center of the first century church after the dispersion of Acts 8.1 when they all left Jerusalem. The Antiochian Byzantine manuscripts and the Textus Receptus. Textus Receptus is a Latin phrase which simply means the received text. There are other texts over here. In short, I will just say that they originated in Alexandria, Egypt at about 2.30. Adamantius Origen went up to Pisidia and got some Byzantium manuscripts and came back down and produced something called a hexapla. And really, everything that we call Western manuscripts ultimately has its origin in the guy named Origen's catechetical school in Alexandria, Egypt. And so all the manuscripts we find up in the Roman text come from Adamantius Origen, from the catechetical school in Alexandria, Egypt. Those guys were Gnostics. They believed in no hell. They believed in universalism. They were amillennialists. All the Jehovah's Witness heresies can be traced back to there. And the King James, from these manuscripts, all the other Bibles, even the New King James, come from these manuscripts here. The editor of the New International Version, the chief editor, has some heretical views about how someone is saved. This is what Edwin Palmer said, who's the chief editor of the NIV. He said, this shows the great error that's so prevalent today in some Orthodox Protestant circles. Namely, the error that regeneration, that's being born again, depends upon faith, and that in order to be born again, one must first accept Jesus as Savior. Now he's calling this a great error prevalent in Orthodox Protestant circles. Well, now that isn't an error, that's the gospel, okay? But it isn't the gospel in the NIV. The King James says, children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. Okay, the new versions say, children, how hard it is to enter into the kingdom of God. Can you imagine handing a little child a Bible that said, children, how hard it is to enter into the kingdom of God? That's the last thing one would want to do because it's easy to be saved. One merely needs to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, okay? So the gospel is a different gospel there. Uh, the new King James changes the gospel also. In Matthew 7, the King James says, narrow is the way, okay? Uh, the New King James says, difficult is the way. Now, it's not difficult. Narrow and difficult are not synonyms. Now, you will find a trend in the New Versions, in many cases, where salvation by faith, believeth, believeth, faith, is changed to obedience, obey. You're not saved, then you're disobeying, okay? The King James will say we have faith, the new versions, like the New King James or the NIV, will say faithfulness. Okay, I have faith because Jesus is faithful. Okay, I am not always faithful. Now looking at John chapter 6, verse 47, the King James Bible said, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Jesus says, I am the door, I am the way. The new versions simply say, He that believes has everlasting life. Believes what? I found when I was collating it. Whenever they make a change from the King James Bible, they follow the New World Translation of the Jehovah Witnesses. We've got the New King James omitting the word God 51 times. That terrible archaic word God, it had to be updated. Jesus is the Son of God, all right? When you look at the New King James Version, you will see that they have taken the word Son away and they call him merely a servant but they wouldn't give Jesus Christ credit for being the son there. Okay, now in Christianity, our faith is unique in that we have a risen savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven. John 16, he prophesied ahead and he says, because I go to the Father. 
In other words, he prophesied that he was going to ascend and be with his father. That very phrase is omitted in all the new versions. And you will see as you follow through some of these examples on this page, when they're talking about the resurrection or the ascension, they either omit it or they question it in a footnote. For instance, in Luke 24, verse 51, one of the most important verses in the Bible, it says, Jesus was parted from them, carried up into heaven, and they worshiped him. Okay, so we have him going up, and we have the people down there worshiping him. In other words, he must have been God. Okay, in the new versions, it merely says he parted from them. Now, we have the Mormon theology that he went to America, took a boat. Uh, we have the New Age philosophy that says he went to the Himalaya Mountains, and he's been staying there for the last 2,000 years, and will come out as Maitreya the Christ. So, the New American Standard Bible, which is this is a sample of, agrees exactly. As a matter of fact, I have some quotations from some of the New Agers where they're quoting this, and they will point to this, and they will say, see, he didn't go up to heaven, he went to the Himalaya Mountains. But we know they worshiped him because he was God and he went up to heaven. Now, the main tenet of the New World Religion is tolerance for the religious beliefs of others, all right? Um, so you could say the New World Religion is inclusive. It includes everyone. As a matter of fact, it will even include Christians if you want to join. All right. Now, Christianity is exclusive. Jesus said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Does Jesus cause division? Yes. In Luke 12, 51, suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. Y'all know that was a Bible verse? Y'all know Jesus said that? In John 7, 43, it says, so there was a division among the people because of him. Jesus was constantly saying things that divided people. Over Dr. Paul did the same thing. He found out part were Pharisees and part were Sadducees, and he said something to divide and conquer. People think that's not Christian. That's very Christian. That's exactly what Jesus and Paul did. Well, the NKJV, the New King James, and the NASB both have Jesus causing division. But then in Titus 3.10, they tell you to reject a divisive man. This is straight antichrist doctrine right here, and here's why. Titus 3.10 in the Bible says heretic, reject a heretic. Heresy is not necessarily divisive. As a matter of fact, the most common popular heresy today for the antichrist is, is false unity, bringing everybody together no matter what. Any, anything that causes division is wicked, and, and we want to bring everybody together. That way the devil can get you all in one gulp. If you're the enemy combat, <laughs> you want everybody together so you can kill them all with one grenade. And that's what the devil wants to do. The Bible says heretic, a heresy, a false doctrine. Get rid of that guy. But the new Bibles change it to the word divisive giving you, number one, an excuse to reject Jesus, but number two, an excuse to kick out anybody who stands for truth. Because I promise you, when you stand for truth, sometimes, you don't want this, but sometimes it'll cause division. The weapon that God uses is His Bible. Uh, the Bible said the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. And I believe that the authorized King James Version from my research has proven to be the very Word of God. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 says, the weapons of our warfare are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. Okay, now, if the only offensive weapon that God gave us in the book of Ephesians that talks about the whole armor of God is the sword, all right, which is the word of God. All of the other uh, armor and all that sort of thing is defensive. And can't you just imagine that if that sword is for the pulling down of strongholds, that Satan would not want his strongholds pulled down. Now, looking at the King James Version on the right and the NIV and the NASB versions on the left, you will see, for example, in Matthew 17, 21, the King James Bible says, This kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Okay? Now, this kind would be a devil. That would be a stronghold that the Word of God could pull down. All right? Now, as we look in the NIV and the NASB, and in most modern translations, that verse has been entirely omitted. 2 Corinthians 6, 5, fastings is omitted. 2 Corinthians 11, 27, fasting is omitted again. Mark 9, 29, this kind cometh forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting, omitted again. 1 Corinthians 7, the fasting is omitted again. Okay, if the sword is the word, 
and that is our weapon. You will see that the word is also omitted from the new versions. Luke chapter 4, verse 4. The King James Bible says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. There's our sword. The new versions say man shall not live by bread alone. They have omitted the sword. You see the word faithful up there in the middle left? And then I have the word corrupt. Okay? These are Alexandrian Roman, and these are Antiochian. So the originals, how many originals do we have today? Zero. So anytime somebody stands up here and says, well, in the original Greek it says, they're either ignorant or deceptive. You have copies. Up here with the faithful copies out of Antioch area, you have over 5,000 of them. But these copies are written on papyrus. It's a cheap paper product made out of plants, and it's going to expire quickly. Those manuscripts are going to wear out fast and be replaced fast. So we have over 5,000, 5,909, I believe, is the going count right now of these Antioch and Byzantine manuscripts. Down here we have about 60, and these are really nice. They're written on vellum, really expensive writing material. It's not going to wear out. So that Bible is going to seem to be older than most of these other manuscripts up here, even though what it says is drastically changed. Today I'm going to be going over Dr. James White. He basically has been the primary proponent of anti-King James onlyism. Now, I myself am a King James onlyist. I don't think that you have to read only from the King James Version. You can read from the new versions. It's just you should probably check, make sure that the passage you're reading from has not been altered. And uh, we're going to just cover here why you shouldn't just trust appearances. And just because a scholar is popular does not mean that they are right. Okay, just because they wear a fancy suit and their videos have half a million views or a million views and they write best-selling books does not mean that they are right. So let's go ahead here and just refute Dr. James White. Five editions of Erasmus. The uh, 1550 edition of Stephanus. So they're focusing on attacking the Texas Receptus. As Erasmus himself said, his first edition was precipitated rather than edited. Number of errors in it. He went into the book of Revelation. By the way, the King James translators did not use only the Texas Receptus. The Texas Receptus had various editions and it was not the only collection that went into the translation of the King James Bible. We side with the majority Byzantine type text. I gotta tell the story now. Erasmus only had between six and 12 manuscripts. We have 5,700. So the 5,000 manuscripts that he just slated as being preferred by the new versions were actually King James, but he's flipping it around and saying that the King James, by isolating the Texas Receptus, he's flipping it around and saying that the King James only comes from six manuscripts. That text that was used for the King James became known as the Texas Receptus from, from the 1600s till the late 1800s. That was pretty much the text that was used, even though it had a very small manuscript tradition behind it. Then, as more and more manuscripts are found, you have the drive to create a critical edition. And so, as we found earlier in early manuscripts, now our critical editions, which take into consideration not only the Greek manuscripts, but all these other translations, have a much broader... <laughs> He's like taking the KJV arguments and applying them to the new versions when they apply for the KJV. He's like defending the KJV, but then acting like it's for the new versions when it's the opposite. Okay, the other translations like the Peshitta, the old Syriac from the Byzantine line, these all agree with the Byzantine line, and the majority of them come from the Byzantine area. That's based on the TR. The New King James is all- It's based on the TR and the majority Byzantine text. Let's continue. There's going to be those places that it's going to vary in its text from ESV, NASB, NIV, Holman Christian Study, which are all based upon the modern eclectic text, which has this much broader- oh, The modern eclectic text, which has a much broader- This is the argument that these guys always use, okay? They're, what they really mean by eclectic is that they have now combined the majority 5,000 plus Byzantine manuscripts with these corrupt Alexandrian manuscripts. For instance, you can look at the pages on-, on uh Sinaiticus, you can look it up online, look at the photostatic copies. And when you get to the end of Mark, where the verses are taken out, you don't just want to waste lines, but you'll see entire sections just open, just not there. You wouldn't do that. You would start <laughs> Luke and you would start it right there. You wouldn't waste any space. But you see space just missing in some of these old manuscripts 
where they say the oldest and best don't have them. They're taken out. They weren't added to the good manuscripts. They were taken out. The very words of God. He said, the words that I've spoken unto you, the same will judge you in the last day. And if God's going to judge us by those very words, he must give us each and every single word. Just recently, in the 50s and 60s, the oldest papyra in the world, attesting to the reading in John chapter 7, was discovered. It's called P. 66. Okay, they're dating this about 180 AD. So this is the very oldest copy of this portion of John that exists on earth. Now this was recently discovered. So those gentlemen who went to seminary or whose professors went to seminary before this collation came out would not be aware of this information. I'm afraid that many of the seminary professors and their students are simply behind the times with the collation of the papyra. But I want you to notice something here. The word spirit, there's a line above it. Okay, they always put a line above the names of deity in these old manuscripts. But above the word holy, you will see some little dashes. Those dashes are called obelisks. The obelisk was what is called a critical mark from the Alexandrian school. Now this papyra was found near Alexandria, Egypt. And that, those little dashes meant omit this. In other words, on the face, the original face of the oldest manuscript in the world attesting to this verse, it said Holy Spirit. And whoever was writing over this, or whoever was editing this, wanted to omit the word holy. And so if God is holy, we can see his name there, Holy Ghost, several times. When we look at the new versions, it's simply Spirit, okay? Holy has been, very often it's being removed from the new versions. So we can see that the King James Version, Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost, is the original reading, and they wanted to omit the word holy, looking at those dashes above there. I would be surprised if the average seminary professor knows about that information. Second Corinthians 2.17, this is Paul talking. Already people are corrupting the word of God. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Satan's first attack was on the word of God. The very first question introduced to the Bible was by Satan, the serpent, and that question was, yea, hath God said? So his first point of attack is the word of God, hath God said, but by prayer and fasting. Okay, his method was subtlety. The Bible says the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. So we know that his major attack is going to be number one on the word of God, and number two is going to be a subtle attack. We have Brooke Foss Westcott, who is the man who took the traditional Greek text underlying the authorized King James Version back in 1881, and he changed it in 8,000 places. It is the equivalent of First and Second Peter, just gone. A word here, half a verse here, half a verse there, a verse here. First and Second Peter, if you were to add it all up, just gone out of your Bible. Eight chapters. See ya. Here's portions of verses omitted from Matthew. That's a lot. Now, if you're just reading your chapter a day to keep the devil away, you're not going to notice this. Portions of verses missing out of Mark. That's a lot. Jeremiah 26, it says, diminish not a word. And I'd remind that when Jesus fed the 5,000, after it was over, he said, gather the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Now, can you imagine the creator of the universe sending everyone scurrying around in the grass to get little scraps of bread. If he was so concerned about those little fragments of bread, which were mere typologies of the Word of God, which is our bread, he isn't going to lose one single word of the Bible. You know, the Word is the light unto my path. In Luke 11 it says, having no part dark. Portions of verses omitted out of Luke. Portions of verses omitted out of John. Omitted out of Acts. It's a lot. A minute out of Romans, thou shalt not bear false witness. You think that would be kind of a nice thing to have in your Bible? Portions of verses missing out of the rest of the New Testament. This isn't all of them, but I've started summarizing. Omitting all of those things that you saw omitted in the NIV and the NASB. I'm quoting his partner on the Greek text. His partner's name was Hort. And this is what Hort said. America is a standing menace to the whole civilization. He said... I wish the American Union may be shivered to pieces. I'm quoting again from his 
uh, biography, my deep hatred of democracy in all its forms. Okay. 8,000 places this gentleman changed the Greek text. And so Westcott and Hort, they have to invent this Lucian recension theory, which there's absolutely no historical evidence for, where they have to come up with a reason why the people up in the Antioch area add it to the Bible, when really what's happening is it's being taken out down in Alexandria, Egypt. The Greek text underlying the New International Version is called the United Bible Societies and the Nestles Greek Text. They have, in essence, taken Westcott's Greek text. The Nestles Allen text in the 25th through the 28th edition has actually added 400 Textus Receptus readings back into the Nestles Allen text because they had to finally concede and say these are more accurate, they are authentic. Your Bible is not translated from originals. It is not even translated from copies. It is translated from Greek texts. These line of Bibles down here prefer these manuscripts as more authoritative, more scholastic, better. The Dark Ages was caused by this line of manuscripts. And it was the resurgent of this line of manuscripts with Erasmus's Greek text, which caused the Protestant Reformation. It's what lit the fire in the heart of Luther and caused the Protestant Reformation. Erasmus wanted to use Vaticanus. He, he wouldn't have had any problem using Vaticanus, but he was in Rome, he couldn't get to it. Oh, Erasmus wanted to use Vaticanus. Vaticanus. Oh, he... Erasmus wanted to use Vaticanus. He, he wouldn't have had any problem using Vaticanus, but he was in Rome, he couldn't get to it. Now let's see the debunking, shall we, ladies and gentlemen. Erasmus rejected Vaticanus. All right, Reverend Windsor, the assemblies being fully aware of the Vaticanus manuscripts, Al Hemd, Trinitarian Bible Society, Jerusalem, Israel. This guy spent a long time actually studying the manuscripts. I am preparing a book right now answering James White's book, The King James Only Controversy. White makes the silly claim that had Erasmus known of the Vaticanus manuscript, he would have used its readings. I prove that entirely wrong. Erasmus references the Vaticanus manuscript in the preface to his 1535 edition of the Texas Receptus, and he condemns it. 350 readings from it were made available to him, and he rejected it on the ground that it did not follow the scriptural citations of the Orthodox Fathers, like, and then he lists all the Orthodox Fathers. I cite Erasmus' own remarks in my book. Anyway, so Gene Kim here is covering the Dean of Chichester, and he was living during the times when they first released these new versions that included these Alexandrian manuscripts. And so let's see what Dr. Gene Kim has to say about this quickly. Quote, all four, he's talking about these four, where the modern Bibles come from. He quotes, all four are discovered on careful scrutiny to differ essentially. How much? So this is the evidence. Not only from the 99 out of the 100. <laughs> That's how big. 99 out of 100 of the whole body of extant manuscripts, but even from each other, end of quote. That's found in the Revision Revised, Dean Bergen's the author, page 12. So I don't know if you heard that. So basically, this is the evidence. And then right here is what? According to Dean Bergen. See that? So... A lot of scholars, they'll try to make it sound like the KJV does not come from the majority of the manuscripts, and they'll claim, oh, we got more manuscripts today than before, and blah, 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 blah. But you know, those critics, they can't deny this. Here are the critics of the KJV, okay? This is from the Nestle Allen text, right? The Nestle Allen text is the standard, the authority that all manuscript scholars go by, okay? The Nestle Allen, all right? Everyone respects it, they recognize it. So that one's like a recognized textbook for man manuscript scholars. So those guys do not believe the KJV, all right? So you know what even those guys admitted about this one? They called it, quote unquote, the majority of all manuscripts. Another one of their quotes, reading supported by the majority of all manuscripts. See that? Even they recognize that. Even they recognize KJV comes from that. Now we're going to come back over here. And so since Dr. James White already knows that the KJV aligns with the majority 99% text and those four manuscripts have been heavily criticized throughout their history, Let's look at the difference between the majority text and the minority. He now has to defend the Alexandrian text, and this is how far he goes. The Byzantine text, which is the majority text, he has to therefore set the Alexandrian text up against the Byzantine text, and this is what he says. 
even if that becomes the most popular text. There's a reason why the Byzantine text is the most popular. Again, Latin Vulgate in the West, all the other places where Greek was being spoken, taken over by Islam, guess what place is left over producing Greek manuscripts? The area around Byzantium. And so the text type that was predominant there becomes the vast majority. But the vast majority of those come from after a thousand years after Christ. If you just look at the first thousand years of church history, the majority text is not the Byzantine text, it's the Alexandrian. Oh, it's the Alexandrian text. The total of the Alexandrian manuscripts that we have available to us today is around 50. <laughs> so it's 50 versus 5,000. Now, here are examples of manuscripts and different translations that date back to the same time period as the Alexandrian manuscripts. And let's continue. I want to know what the original writers wrote. And God has given us the means to know that. People ask, though, well, why couldn't God have avoided textual variation? Folks, you need to realize that the way God did this is as soon as the gospel goes out of the world, the Christians want everybody to hear it, and so they let everyone copy their manuscripts. Thousands of those manuscripts were destroyed by Roman soldiers, and the people who possessed them killed. Many survived to our day, thankfully. But they wanted that out there. They didn't say, are you a professional scribe? We want to make sure that you don't make any mistakes here. That's actually not correct. The people who they entrusted to copy them were very meticulous. He's trying to paint it as everybody who copied these manuscripts were just clumsy with their hands and we have so many variations. That's not true. There are minor variations and there's a major gap in variations between the majority text and the minority 50 or so manuscripts. The false Greek texts B and Aleph contradict one another in over 3,000 places in the Gospels alone, and those are the oldest and best manuscripts that they translate the NASB and the NIV from. These two guys, Westcott and Hort. In 1881, they produced the Westcott and Hort Greek New Testament. Every Bible that's been translated since 1881 has come from their corrupt manuscripts, every single one of them. Let me tell you what these guys believe. These guys, if you have an NIV or an NASB, the guys who are responsible for the Greek underlying it, this is their own words. I reject the word infallibility of the Holy Scriptures overwhelmingly. That's Westcott. Hort said, evangelicals seem to me perverted. There are, I fear, still more serious differences between us, me and evangelicals, on the subject of authority, especially the authority of the Bible. Westcott said about Jesus, this is about the deity of Christ. He said, he never speaks of himself directly as God, but the aim of his revelation was to lead men to see God in him. Westcott did not believe Jesus was God. Westcott said, John does not expressly affirm the identification of the word with Jesus. He's trying to say that the word wasn't necessarily Jesus. The Jehovah's Witnesses jump all over. That's why the NASB if you have an NASB in John 1.18, it has Jehovah's Witness belief in it. It says Jesus is a begotten God in John 1.18. Hort says, I confess I have no repugnance to the primitive doctrine of a ransom paid to Satan. I can see no other possible form in which the doctrine of ransom is at all tenable. Anything is better than the doctrine of a ransom to the Father. In other words, the blood that was shed was a payment to Satan. That's in their own words. And Westcott had a club called the Hermes Club. As you know, Hermes is the name of the devil. Um, he had a club. The book of Hermes is in the Greek manuscript, Sinaiticus, underlying the New International Version. So if the New International Version translators were honest, they would have translated the book of Hermes because it is a part of their text in the Sinaiticus manuscript. My contention is if someone doesn't know what books belong in the Bible, how can they know what words belong in the Bible? But anyway, the book of Hermes tells us, number one, take the name. There it is, the name. Take the name of the beast. Number two, give up to the beast. Number three, form a one world government. Four, kill those not receiving the name. Not receiving the name. Kill them. Remember in Matthew it says, though time will come and they think that whosoever killeth you does God's service, okay? The book of Hermes actually tells people, kill those who won't receive the name. When they add this on to the end of the Bible, there will be people in churches reading this, thinking, oh, we're to kill those who don't receive the name, and then they'll be out after, you know, looking for Christians there. Now, something strange has been happening in the NIV. When it first came out, very often it would say, the name of the Lord. And in the most recent 
printing. So now that everyone's checked it, it's starting to say the name. And they're beginning to capitalize the end. So it no longer says the name of the Lord. It's the name. Okay? They had another club called the Ghostly Guild. In that club, the two Greek translators were there, along with Lightfoot, who gave us what you can buy in a Christian bookstore today. Now this group became the Society for Psychical Research, who interviewed Madame Blavatsky, and they were favorably impressed with Madame Blavatsky. I don't know if any of you have ever seen a picture of her, but I wanted you to see what she looked like. But she started the Theosophical Society, and her two books, The Secret Doctrine One and The Secret Doctrine Two, are the Bibles for the New Age movement. The Theosophical Society are the perpetuators of Luciferianism, for the most part. And Constance Cumbie was kind enough to fax me the transactions of the first annual Congress of the Theosophical Society, which took place around 1900. And I want to read a quote to you from that. They said in around 1900, I believe it is through the churches and not through the Theosophical Society that Theosophy, and we've discussed that that is the worship of Lucifer, must and should come to large bodies of people. So they said in their first proceedings that this Lucifer worship was going to come through the church. It wasn't going to come through the Theosophical Society. Now, on another page in this quote, the work of destructive criticism, now they're talking about textual criticism, they're talking about Westcott's Greek text. The work of destructive criticism has paved the way, sweeping away certain passages which grate on the ears. The phrase washed in the blood is one. Okay. Now that doesn't grate on my ears, that's how I'm getting to heaven. Okay. So we look at the NIV today, in the New American Standard Bible. Following the textual criticism at the turn of the century, you will see that Colossians 1.14, through his blood, has been removed. Now washed relates to the blood again. The blood which is shed, Luke chapter 22, or the cup which is poured. Now you all are pouring cups tonight, but none of you are shedding blood, I hope. Okay, the average person, when they read that, they don't see the difference. The King James, this is my body which is broken for you. Now, it's not only broken, but it's broken for us, for our sins. Uh, Christ suffered, okay? That's all omitted, the blood and all that stuff that they wouldn't like. Hebrews 1, 3, by himself purged our sins. The blame is for us. He didn't die for his own sins. He died for our sins. He suffered for us. He was sacrificed for us. Okay, none of that is included in the NIV or the NASB. It simply says he was sacrificed or he suffered. You know, did he suffer for his own sins, according to these people, but not for us? Okay, so we have a different gospel there. Now, um, Henry Travers Edge was a friend of Madame Blavatsky, and he wrote a book in 1881 and he said quote the new versions have produced a rendering much more in accord with the views of a theosophist okay he said this in a book called esoteric keys now these gentlemen Westcott and Hort not only were spiritualists making contact with the dead they were socialists or communists uh, Marx and Lenin were very influenced by something called Hegel's dialectical materialism dialectical simply means we take one extreme and another extreme and we make everyone sick of the extremes and they pick the middle. For instance, communism, very extreme on one end. Uh, democracy, some would say, Marx would, very extreme on the other end. What you land up with is international socialism, which is where we are moving to today. Okay? Now, this is what they're doing with the Bibles. They will create these horrible, terrible, inclusive Bibles, the New Revised Standard, some of these extreme ones. And they'll look at those and they'll say, bad, bad, you know. And then the King James, they'll pretend that it's archaic. And then they'll try to find something like the New King James or the NIV that's right in the middle. It's, they're simply using Hegel's dialectical technique. If we only had one manuscript, then we'd have to trust that whoever controlled that one manuscript never tampered with it. That's the problem the Muslims have. We actually have the better situation. God provisionally has provided us with a solid foundation for believing in the inspiration and accuracy of the New Testament. Thank you. What does that mean? So now we have the inspiration and accuracy. And earlier in this, he says he believes in the inerrancy of the Bible. What does that mean? He doesn't have a Bible that he believes that is inerrant. But I want to make this strong assertion. And I'll back okay, he's going to make a strong assertion and he's going to back it up here. Back this up uh, to the hill. 
to the hill. I take either of those two texts that Pastor Mormon has on the desk right there, and I apply the same translation procedure to those two books. I will not have a different doctrine or teaching. Which have over 2,900 words missing compared to the majority, 99% of Byzantine type texts. I might have a different list of verses that support anyone. No, he's going to have a different list of verses, but he's somehow going to come up with the same doctrine. Now, James White is a Calvinist. Doctrinally, that doctrine is the enemy doctrine of dispensationalism. And I am a dispensationalist. Dispensationalism has been under attack ever since 1944, when a group of Calvinists, official committee of Calvinists, many of them from the Presbyterian Church, officially tried to ban dispensationalism, and they were attacking the founder of Dallas Theological Seminary. But let's continue here. He claims that using these manuscripts with 2,900 fewer words, these two manuscripts disagree with each other in numerous places as well, and they are among the most edited manuscripts, re-edited and changed manuscripts in history. But if you use the same hermeneutics on either of those texts, you will have the same faith. There is no question about that. Oh, there's no question about it. The same hermeneutics, you're going to come up with the same doctrine. And he's looking so confident about that. Okay, let's go over here to the Bible, <laughs> or the different versions of the Bible, right? Now, 2 Timothy 2.15, which is the one verse in the Bible that tells you how to study the Bible. And if we see the King James Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So it tells you to study the Bible, and it says that how you study the Bible is by rightly dividing it. None of the new versions other than the New King James Version, right, maintains this reading. It all says what? Let's see the New American Standard Bible. Okay, it says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed. Accurately what? Handling the word of truth. Well, wait a second. This verse here, 2 Corinthians 4.2. It says, But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Was that difficult to understand? I mean, it was from the King James Bible, but is that hard? Was that the Old English? It says here, Nor handling the word of God deceitfully. So what were these heretics doing? They were handling the word of God deceitfully. Now, what's interesting is none of these other versions say that. It all says, right, distort, don't tamper the word of God. But the King James Bible says we don't handle the word of God deceitfully. But these guys say, oh, well, you're supposed to now accurately handle it. So never mind about how the King James says that you're supposed to rightly divide the English Standard Version. It also says rightly handling, right? New International Version, handling. So they're telling you to handle the Bible. I mean, that just basically means everybody's going to have their own interpretation, right? Because there's no way that you can take all of the verses in the entire Bible and have them all harmonize perfectly together with each other. People are going to run into problems such as contradictions. They're going to claim that, well, you know, they're going to have to prefer certain verses as literal and other verses are going to be forced to make them allegorical through a incorrect erroneous hermeneutical approach right we have a correct hermeneutical approach that comes from the bible which tells us how not to handle the bible how to rightly divide the word of truth so you keep the bible as it says and you divide the passages to the correct audience according to what the bible tells you the correct audience is because certain verses are going to contradict if you try to combine them together rather you need to divide them to the proper setting of the time the audience the context of what's being spoken all right now let's scroll down here really quickly and look at the first commentary ellicott's commentary for english readers and what does it say rightly dividing the word of truth better rendered as rightly laying out the word of truth the greek word translated in the english version rightly dividing literally signifies cutting a straight line i believe the greek word is arthantamuta and that literally in the majority of the greek it means to straightly cut right it seems most correct to regard it as a metaphor from laying out a road kind of like this this is a dispensational chart by clarence larkin now, remember we said it was going to come through the churches. 
This was Madame Blavatsky's newspaper. The name of the newspaper was Lucifer. Nothing like being upfront with what you're all about. It says, I, Jesus, right there, am the bright and morning star, Lucifer. Okay, now she's giving a reference here to 2 Peter and to Revelation 22. Now, does the Bible say that the bright morning star is Lucifer? Of course not. Peter and Revelation talk about Jesus Christ, who is the bright and morning star. There is nothing alike about them at all. Okay? But she is saying, I, Jesus, am Lucifer the bright morning star. Now this was back in the late 1800s. But remember they said they were going to come in through the churches. Okay, this was their plan. Now, in the NIV and also the NASB and other Bibles, they have omitted the name Lucifer from Isaiah 14:12, And they have substituted the name of Jesus Christ here, morning star. So it says, how have you fallen from heaven, morning star? So if someone ran Morning Star through an NIV concordance and wanted to see who is the Morning Star, they would conclude that Jesus Christ and the fallen angel were one and the same person. And I had a student at Kent State University ask me that very thing, and that's what propelled me into my research on this course. He said, is Isaiah 14 about Lucifer, as the King James Bible says, or is it about um, Jesus? And I said, well, certainly it's the fall of Lucifer. And he said, oh no, it's about Jesus Christ. And this young man had become very confused. I believe in the Pope because he believes in peace. And my definition of peace is accepting all religion. Accepting all religion. I expect him to get down to business and start tackling the very sensitive issues of reform and clean up of the church. Lucifer matutinus in in quam Lucifer, queen eschit o casum, Christus filius tus, qui regressus ab inferis, humano generis serenus iluxit, et tecum vivit et regnat in secula seculorum. This was precursed by Madame Blavatsky saying, I, Jesus, am the bright and morning star Lucifer over 100 years ago. Now, if you look in the Roman Catholic Latin Vulgate, and if you read it in Latin, in 2 Peter 1.19, it will say, et Lucifer orator. When you translate that into English, it means Lucifer rising. So the Roman Catholic Latin Vulgate Bible has always said that Lucifer was Jesus Christ. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. We have far more in common than what divides us. When you talk about Pentecostals, Charismatics, Evangelicals, uh, Fundamentalists, uh, fundamentalist, Catholics, Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, and on, on and on and on. And when you understand what they mean by what they're saying, there's a whole lot more commonality. Now, there's still real differences, no, no doubt about that. But the most important thing is if you love Jesus, we're on the same team. The unity that I think we would see realistically is not a structural unity, but a unity of mission. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? 
And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Westcott and Hort had another club. Again, we see Henry Sedgwick, who was one of the arch Luciferians at that time in England. Now we also see an introduction of Arthur Balfour, who became the Prime Minister of England. Okay, they were also in a club called the Uranus Club, Hort and Westcott. There again, the arch Luciferian of that time, Henry Sedgwick. Now, if we had time, I could keep going with quotes from these guys. These guys were heretics. They didn't believe in Jesus Christ as God. They were Arian and Gnostic in their beliefs. It's absolutely horrendous. I wouldn't go near these new Bibles with a 10-foot pole. But if you're educated, you have to, to look good to all your buddies. Arthur Balfour, the prime minister in this club. Okay, now Arthur Balfour started the League of Nations and the fetal Council on Foreign Relations with Cecil Rhodes. But what we see happening here in England, because the devil doesn't know when he's going to be allowed to take over. We see the dragon in the form of a cultist like Sedgwick. We see the beast in the form of Balfour, the Prime Minister of England, and we see the false prophet in the form of Westcott and Hort. And so you can look at almost any country in any time and see the powers that be cavorting with these uh, Satans and these Luciferians. But I want you to understand, people say, how many Bibles are out there? How many are out there? There's two. There's two Bibles. That's it. The Waldensians, the Donatists, and those guys, the Paulicians, those guys have been hiding underground all through the Dark Ages. People who believe what we believe existed underground the entire time. And we use the TR manuscripts the entire time. Now remember the New King James took the blood out 23 times. And the NIV takes the blood out 41 times. Now remember they said it was going to happen through the churches, okay? Here is a copy of Christianity Today. I believe it's January 1996. Okay, we have a gentleman on the cover who I suspect is a Christian. His name's John Stott. He's an intellectual, but you know, I don't know anything bad about him, so perhaps he's a Christian. However, on the back cover, now remember we said wolves in sheep's clothing. Okay, we're all looking for wolves, aren't we? It's wolves in sheep's clothing. So start looking for the sheep's clothing and then look for the wolves, okay? Uh, on the back cover of Christianity Today is an advertisement for John Marks Templeton and his book called, Is God the Only Reality? This book is about monism, pantheism, teaching that you are God. I mean, it's so anti-Christian as to be unbelievable. John Marks Templeton is a promoter of Lucius Trust, which is also known as Lucifer Publishing Company, the Theosophical Society. Okay, we all know about his involvement with the Parliament of World Religions. John Marks Templeton is not only involved with Lucius Trust, he is on the board of the American Bible Society. This is called infiltration, ladies and gentlemen. And so now what it's going to come down to is the opinions of those we trust. And just like Satan wants, our God becomes education. You see? Let me get the most scholarly person, get their opinion, and I promise you for every scholarly person you find, there's going to be another one who has the other opinion. But your authority is going to be, your God is going to be education. It says in 2 Timothy 3, 4, that men will be heady and high-minded. You know, until 1881, all Christians use the same Bible. All non-Catholic Christians use the same Bible until 1881. You talk about causing division. The introduction of the new Bibles, in my opinion, is what has brought on the Laodicean church era. All the churches apostatizing, the sermons are going to pot. There's no Bible-believing Christianity anymore. There's nobody who's sold out and living for God like it matters anymore. And I think it's because of these corrupt satanic Bibles. The Philadelphian church kept his word. And every great thing that all the great Christian heritage that we have in America came from a King James Bible. The trouble with our liberal friends is not that they are ignorant, but that they know so much that isn't so. That's what Ronald Reagan said. The King James Bible supporter. And I know if you are educated, if you go to seminary, 
you get taught that the NASB is the most reliable translation because of the formal equivalence versus dynamical equivalence, and I can throw a bunch of more 50 cent words at you that would be impressive, and they will too. Now, people may say to you, you know, believing in the King James Bible is divisive, or they may say to you, <clears throat> that's usually something that's used. And I'd like to give you a couple examples of verses that might help you. The first is 1 Corinthians 1.10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you. So the idea there in Corinthians is that if everyone speaks the same thing, there is no division. So to believe that King James is the pure, preserved Word of God, to believe that there is just one Bible, that's the way to keep from having division. The truth of the Lord endureth forever. Every Word of God is pure. Every Word of God is pure. Not the fundamentals, not the doctrines, not the principles, not what it teaches. Every word of God is pure, not the message. Every word. He is a shield to them to put their trust in them. Add thou not to his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. But the word our God shall stand forever. It shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name.